A call to worship this morning is from Psalm 118. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go through them and I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous shall enter. I will praise you for you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Beloved congregation in our Lord Jesus Christ, our help is in the name of Jehovah God. He's made the heavens and the earth. He's redeemed us by the blood of the Lamb, and He's coming again. Let us receive His blessing. Grace, mercy, and peace be granted unto you from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Lord, through the working of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue in our worship in song number 234, which is a versification of the psalm we just read. The glorious gates of righteousness. Let's sing stanzas one, two, three, four, and six. The first four and number six. It is our godly tradition to read regularly from the Ten Commandments, the abiding moral law of God. We also preach on them here, knowing that this moral law of God is a wonderful teacher of our sin. You can't hide from sin when the law of God is in front of you. And then, though, it leads us to Jesus, does the law of God, and because we know we need a righteousness that's absolutely perfect, and we don't have that in ourselves, so we fly to Jesus by faith. Then the law becomes an amazing way we can show God our gratitude. Something to live by is the law. So it's our delight as we seek to show off the praises of God and hear what God said to 
to Israel long ago. God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. And you note, beloved, God says he's a jealous God, not in the bad sense, of course, as we could become jealous, but he wants our devotion. He's the, the groom, he's the great husband of Israel, and he wants their singular attention. And when Israel goes after other gods and takes his name in vain and so on, he is jealous for their devotion. He wants them back. And so does God want our singular devotion, and he shows us mercy as we show him devotion. And then you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God, in it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. I trust, uh, beloved people of God, that as we've gone through these commandments, it's not just been with a kind of a a functionality or formality, but with a deep sense of our need to pay attention to these things. The law here is God's standard. So have we learned our sin, something more of it, as we've read these Ten Commandments? Have we seen the need for Jesus and a righteousness that is, is of grace? And then and now do we see this is the way I want to live? Children, you say that too. This is the way I want to live. Just as God says, I'm, I'm his child, I'm baptized in his name, and now I want to show that. I want to show with a real Christianity, this God is mine, and I'm his, and that's a good thing. It's the greatest thing ever. And Jesus reminds us, too, of what it's all about, really. He told one fellow one day, and he tells us today, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, with all your soul. And he says, this is the first commandment, and it's, it's the, the greatest thing ever there. It's the priority of our lives. It's what all the law and the prophets are talking about. But then, now we show this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So love God, love the neighbor for God's sake. This is the commandments of God, all the law and the prophets. In the light of the gospel, good news we can live by. Let's now uh, turn in our Psalter hymnals to number 111, O Lord, my God, most earnestly.
It is good to be in the house of the Lord again uh, this week, uh, this beginning of the week, this great day of the, the New Testament Sabbath called the Lord's Day. We're, we're so mindful of the blessing of God that we have. And that's why we assemble as God's people together. And we need to be assured of this, don't we? Those commandments are those, again, those so many nails to our coffin. They would each and every one of them condemn us as we stand in ourselves. And we're like this psalmist, too. We've been wandering around this week in, in a certain way from one sin to the next. We've been seeking oases or refugees in mirages of men. That's my experience. That's my sinfulness, I confess to you. And I trust your experience is something like that. We're these sinners who, though we've been purchased by the blood of Jesus, we're still those with an inclination to sin. But now, the psalmist reminds us that there's sheltering wings neath the Savior's arms. Beautiful consolation in our pilgrimage here below. And that's what we need to be reminded of as we enter into prayer to God together. So, congregation, those who may be visiting, we call you to prayer. God does. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, prayer, what a great gift you give us. You give us the ability to talk with you as sons and daughters to a Father in heaven and as a bride to a husband to whom we are espoused and for which the consummation of marriage is soon. What a great delight, Father, to talk to you of things eternal and things mundane, of everything of our life. And what a great blessing it is, Father, to hear from you in this gift of prayer. That's what we want to do, hear. Hear from you first of all, Lord. That's our prayer, the listening ears. What would you say to us? Of what great blessings would you remind us, Lord? Surely of Jesus. Oh, God, remind us of Jesus, your Son, that great gift for sinners worldwide, all kinds of sinners of every stripe, red, black, brown, yellow, white sinners, all kinds of sinners of high and low. We're there in that world fallen in Adam, but you'd remind us of Jesus given for a new world, a world to be redeemed by his blood, a world that will be formed after his own image by the spirit he gives to apply his own salvation life to them, to that world. So, Father, remind us of him. Because we confess our sins have been great and many, and as we enter your house, there's a lot of dirt, and we think about the dirt, and we think about the dirt that cleaves to us, and the sins we've committed often in our tongues, even on the way to the Lord's house. We ask you, Lord, your blessing that we can truly know Jesus, the forgiver of sins, as we confess our sins to you in his name. We're sorry. We're sorry for being the commandment breakers we ought not to be, the ones who don't love you as we ought and the neighbor as we ought. We're, we're sorry, Lord. We're sorry that our priorities in this past week have been mixed up, all mixed up, with a lick and a promise, as we've said, we've started days maybe or paused in the days to remember you, but it hasn't been what the days have been all about. It's been about us and our excursions and our delights, and we've hardly given you a thought. Lord God, we're sorry. Of all people were to be thankful and full of praise, you have said this people I formed for my praise, and here we go again. Here we go. Caught up in the things of the earth, and not only that, but in the sin of the whole world that lies in wickedness and is under condemnation. Lord, 
Renew us, we pray, with a vital faith, a faith that truly clings to Jesus, our righteousness, and loves the sweet exchange of the cross where our unrighteousness was imputed to him and his righteousness was charged to our account and we're justified. Lord, give us to know that that's sweet. That's the sweetest thing, the sweetest news, the sweetest fact in all the world, the gospel. You are our God. And there's a tabernacle with men, a place of meeting for sinners, a place of grace. Lord, may our church be that place too. As we manifest that here is a place for sinners and those who are wandering on the way and who seek heaven and on the way seek to be faithful, seek to raise our children and to have them married in the, and among the assembly of the saints so that there is this wonderful perpetuation of your covenant mercies from our own loins. We seek here to preach Jesus, Father, whom you've given among the sons of men. We seek here to bear the fruits of Christ crucified in humility and grace and in a desire to show forth the praises of the God who's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. We pray, Father, to witness here, to be a place of light in the darkness, in our community, in our neighborhood, here on the campus and here in Northeast Grand Rapids, but in whatever neighborhood we're given to say the word, the word of the gospel redemption through the blood of the Lamb. We pray, Father, your blessing to that end upon the preaching of the gospel. May it be powerful, may it be winsome, may it be convincing by a man of God who himself has been persuaded in his study and in the hours of preparation and on his knees in prayer and tears and wrestlings with you, that there is truly a God who lives and he lives within our hearts. Lord, we pray and we may hear and that the hearers may be so moved that they may be transformed in this congregation among those who may be visiting personally and also by internet or radio, that there is a God and that there is this God whose day is now for repentance and faith. Lord, we pray that we may be filled with good works and not weary in well-doing. We may press on and have the first love that you've given to sovereign grace and and increasingly, Lord, in so much the more as we see the day approaching, the day of the return of your Son. Lord, we pray, bless us. Bless us in every way. We are hurting, we are needy, and we know many who are hurting and leading, needing. And so we pray for ourselves and for our loved ones and, and those we don't even know, Father, in their distresses of life. God, we pray, bless with peace. Bless with healing, if it be your will. Bless with a great sense that in distresses our own and others, that there is this balm of Gilead, there is this place on the other side of Calvary of rest and repose and respite in the Lamb and in his arms. Give, Father, that we can in our controversies, in our sins, in our troubles of life, not be distracted, but focused always on the gospel and our, our message and our calling here below. Bless, we pray, all your people, wherever they may be. Give them your rest. And as we discuss these things and hear the word of God from these things of the Sabbath rest and the true rest in Jesus, we pray that you would impress upon our hearts that great and awesome thing of heaven come down, this day of the Lord you have made, this foretaste of eternal rest, this emblem of our eternal rest in Jesus. Hear our prayer and guide us, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Your offering for the general fund of this church will now be received.
Let's sing a song of resurrection, 364, the day of resurrection, three stanzas. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Psalm 118. We've been full of that psalm in our worship already. We have heard the call to worship in the light of that psalm, from that psalm. And we have sung a versification of that psalm in our opening uh, Psalter number. Now we would read from the Word of God here and also reflect upon what this has to say in one of its aspects in one of the verses of Psalm 118. Hear from God what he would say today. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let Israel now say his mercy endures forever. Let the house of Aaron now say his mercy endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord now say his mercy endures forever. I called on the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore, I shall see my desire on those who hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. All nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They surrounded me, yes, they surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. They surrounded me like bees, they were quenched like a fire of thorns, for in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. You pushed me violently that I may fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but live, and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go through them, and I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous shall enter. I will praise you, for you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. 
This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, and he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God. I will praise you. You are my God. I will exalt you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Thus saith the Lord, Psalm 1, and may we say this as well as the people who've heard the word, thanks be to God, his mercy endures forever. In fact, and we say that in response to this psalm, we're, we're speaking with the psalm. The Psalm 118 is a psalm of thanks to the Lord for his mercy that endures forever. You might have noted that, children, when we ran, read the very first verses several times, it's repeated the refrain, we're to give thanks to the Lord and speak because his mercy endures forever. What we need to uh, focus on this morning is that part of the psalm that's central to the psalm of thanks, and that's the celebration of a certain day of salvation. I want to read that with you at this time in verse 21 and following. You'll note here, the psalmist in the midst of being surrounded by enemies who, who, who hate him and so on and saying that he's going to triumph over them, says this in verse 21, I will praise you for you've answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. And then especially this verse, the psalmist reflects upon this. This is the day the Lord has made, this day of salvation. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And, and that's the question I want to give to you today, to put to you today and to myself today. And the question is basically, shall we give thanks? Shall we give thanks? But then the proposition I want to bring before you and have you consider and very, very urgently as well is that if this is the case, if we've answered yes to the first question, shall we give thanks? Shall we then not consider Resurrection Day, that is, the Christian Lord's Day, that Sabbath of the New Testament, to be a great blessing for our thanks and encouragement for our thanks? For this, I find, is the implication of the peoples celebrating a certain day of salvation in the Old Testament in light of the New Testament, this day the Lord has made in which they were rejoicing and being glad in it because God saved them, that is something we celebrate on the Lord's Day. And we want to consider this day that the Lord has made Sunday while we're here in the light of this text, but also as we continue to meditate upon the commandments of God. And the fourth commandment, of course, is you shall observe the Sabbath day, keep it holy, do no manner of work and so on and for various reasons that God gives us. And so we want to consider this positively and in the light of the day that is celebrated in Psalm 118. And as we'll see, it's a very special day and provides great impetus and drive and motivation and a positive reason for us to be in God's house on the Lord's day as often as we can so that we can give thanks to God together and in a godless age, which knows nothing of the day of salvation and wants it not, and shows it by rejecting any kind of Sabbath observance and Sunday attendance and so on, we want to show in the midst of this that there is a God who lives. And the gospel is that this God lives in Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God for our salvation. So we want to consider what's often a controversial subject, even in Christian cir circles. We want to consider it carefully and also prayerfully. I urge you to pray as we're hearing the word and delivering it. We can consider the day that God has made, reflections on the Sabbath in light of creation and redemption, and three things. First of all, that there is a Sabbath that remains for today. And I will find, I believe, that this is implied in the psalmist's word, which is the word of God, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. 
Secondly, I want to consider how we are to observe the Lord's Day. Maybe some of us are puzzling over that. How do you spend Sunday? Is it a real different day, and how should it be? As the Old Testament people of God, the New Testament people of God, or, or what shall it be? But secondly, or thirdly, we want to consider the great blessing of the Sabbath, and that's why, in fact, the psalmist calls all to rejoice and be glad in that day. And also, I would contend on the Sabbath day. Well, as we consider the fourth commandment, we are reminded that there is a Sabbath that has always been for the people of God. In the Old Testament, this comes out in an outstanding way. The Sabbath people of the Old Testament par excellence were the Jews. As many of us, or probably all of us, know, they had a weekly commandment or a commandment to observe weekly what's called the Sabbath. And the commandments were given, first of all, in codified stone form in Exodus. In the fourth commandment, six days, God says there, well, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. And then there's the calling that they should not do any work, not anyone in their house, and so on. Well, little known is it that Israel was more than just a Sabbath-keeping nation on this one day out of seven in the week. No, in fact, they were a Sabbath nation all over the place. There were Sabbath festivals besides the weekly Sabbath, and there, uh, there were stated solemnities or times when they gathered together, for example, at the Passover feast, and they would celebrate the Passover, and in conjunction with that, they'd have a Sabbath. The working and certain sacrifices were done on the Sabbath, and certain things could be eaten or not eaten, and so on. And besides that, there was a Sabbath even for the land, in the year of Jubilee. The whole land was to be given over to rest in the Sabbath. And, and that's what the Sabbath was all about. It was a Sabbath to remind people to rest. That's why they had to stop, stop everything. And in the wilderness, they even had to stop gathering their food, the manna, the day before, or they had to gather twice the day before the Sabbath, the Saturday, in order not to work and gather food on the Sabbath day, on the Saturday. It was so that they could learn something of rest. Well, what kind of rest was it? It wasn't just resting from their works and then just twiddling their thumbs. No, there was a spiritual component to it. And this is brought out in the very reason for the Sabbath in Exodus chapter 20. I didn't read that. I will now. Here's why you are to not do any labor, Israel, and to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Here's why, Exodus 20, verse 11. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day, where therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it, or set it aside as a special day, a very special day. And now, for those Bible scholars among us, we are reminded of Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 2, the very last words, it was then and there that, or, or Genesis 1 and 2, where God established the Sabbath day. He is said to have made all things on the six days, man on the sixth day as well. But then the seventh day, we could say he took a break. Now, did that mean because he had to rest? We know that. The psalmist tells us that God is never weary and faints, and so do the prophets. He never needs a rest. He's the one who is all-powerful, and never, when he works energetically, expends energy as, so that he has to replenish his energy by maybe two or three hours of rest or 24 hours of rest. No, God is this God who rests in a special way. And how? Well, I believe it's God on the Sabbath day, the very first one that he kept for himself, but as a prescription for all time, as we shall see, he kept this in order to contemplate his own creative works. He rested from all of his creative works on the seventh day. He didn't make anything, but he did make a day. So we could really say there were seven days of creation because in the 
seventh day, he made a day, a special day for himself that was to become prescription, order, and blessing for those people who loved the Lord. They wanted to enter the rest of God, and so they would keep Sabbath one day in seven, the seventh day of the week in the Old Testament. So it was God delighting in all that he had made. God uh, beholding everything he had made and reposing in that and, and giving glory to himself. And so a lovely way that God says that he has made everything for his own glory, the Sabbath day. And now Israel was to enter that somehow. They were, in fact, somehow by faith, to be regarding God on that special day. God knew the people of God were very weak, and they would toil and they would do all of their other work six days a week. But the seventh day, God in his wisdom said, you need this day. You need not just an hour, you need a day. And from then it was from sun down to sundown. You need that day to think about me. God himself, we could say, needed a day. No, he took a day, he made a day, the day this Lord had made in day seven, we also need to be in the image of God that way and to enter into God's own fellowship. Now, how important is that? Well, it's so important God codified it. He made a law about it. Fourth commandment, the one commandment that has to do especially with time. The time, the weekly time, the daily time, and even, as we shall see, time in light of eternity. Well, so then, it was for Israel, and I believe it was for all people, somehow to know that there's this God who's created all things. We have to think about that. Stop. How hard that is, isn't it? How hard for us to stop. Here we are going, 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 wound up. It seems like on the Sunday, that's, that's why it's so hard to rest and stop because we've been wound up and winding up the clock, as it were, and being high strung. And it's not just the children, but it's all of us. So Sunday comes and we either collapse or we keep on going and our minds are rushing a mile a minute. But God says, stop. I give you a day. It's a great blessing. It wasn't, you see, just to, it wasn't at all to shackle the people of God. It was to bless the people of God as all the commandments were as they were given and as they were given especially to Israel. But now, there's another reason for Sabbath, and that is promulgated to us in the second giving of the law, Deuteronomy chapter 5. And you can follow with me if you want in, that in the reading of that commandment. But in Deuteronomy chapter 5, we read this answer or this reason for the uh, Sabbath in Israel. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord, he says in Deuteronomy 5, verse 14. And here's the motivation, verse 15. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. There's a reason. The first reason in Exodus was God rested on the seventh day. And remember, that was before the fall. But after the fall, there was another motivation for keeping the same, the very same Sabbath day, and that was this, deliverance from Egypt. And deliverance from Egypt was this great picture of deliverance from sin and the bondage of sin. And it was through the Passover lamb, and, and, and Israel knew this thing. It was this land of the pictures and land of the promises and land of the prophecies of Jesus Christ, in fact. In fact, that's why the Sabbath was given to Israel, that they might know something of the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, follow me. This is the Old Testament. It's the Old Testament people of God. But always God in the Old Testament was writing of greater things and things that would be brought to light in the fullness of time. When Jesus would step into time, when he would fulfill the promises and there would be yea and amen in him and he would be the one in whom we have rest and so on. But I go ahead of myself and I want to keep right with the Bible itself here. It's Psalm 118. Notice Psalm 118. There's a celebration of a day in light of a, a peculiar, awesome, 
wonderful, marvelous event on a marvelous day. Let's look at this. Psalm 118, 21 through 24. I will praise you. You've answered me and have become my salvation. Now, stop right there. We don't know the occasion of this psalm. The psalmist is surrounded on every side by nations, in fact, that were opposed to him and to God. Maybe there was some deliverance. Maybe, maybe there was some festal day. Be that as it may, we know this. The psalmist was so sure of salvation, he says it with an is. The Lord has become my salvation. It's true. And this is part of the wonder of the word of God. You see, then they're speaking of salvation. But we know it's all picturing what really salvation is, pardon from sin, deliverance from the devil and from flesh and the world unto fellowship with God. And the psalmist already way back then, even as Isaiah the prophet in chapter 53 would speak of the Lamb of God who is given for our iniquities and so on. He is so assured, such as the power of the word and the, the everlasting consequence of the promise of salvation, it's as if it were then, and it's, if that, it's as if the day of salvation was already upon him. Look, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It was marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Now, what's that all about? It speaks of some stone, and oftentimes in Israel, the stone would be represented by, or the king of Israel would represent the stone or the strength of Israel. And that's what I believe he's doing here. But it's rejected. The stone is rejected. And, but lo and behold, he's become the chief cornerstone. And this is the Lord's doing. And who could ponder it? So it's marvelous in our eyes. What's he talking about? Well, we just have to go to the New Testament to see that this is a celebration of Jesus' own redemption. The psalmist is quoted, in fact, in Peter's sermon, Acts 4 and verse 11, or verse 10 I'll go to, Let it be known to you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands before you whole. Notice, he's crucified, and he's raised from the dead. And Peter is speaking to Jews here. This is the stone, he says, which was rejected by you builders, the Jews, who should have been loving Jesus and receiving him as their Savior. They rejected him. He's now become the chief cornerstone. When did that occur? That occurred when Jesus, who was crucified, was raised from the dead. On that day, God pronounced him king and confirmed that he's the Son of God. That's the glory of the Sabbath day in Israel already prophesying Old Testament language and type to be sure, but looking ahead to the reality of the day Jesus rose and the day that's to be celebrated for all eternity, beginning now, every week and every day. Peter, as well, uh, speaks of this in 1 Peter and chapter 2, 6 and 7. And Peter is led by the Spirit to say, Therefore it's contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore to you who believe he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and so on. So you have in the New Testament this confirmation that the psalmist here is looking ahead to gospel realities. And that's how we read our Bibles. That's the glory of this book. It's not about one message maybe for Israel and another Jewish people, but it's a message for, and then a different message for the church. It's a message for one people of God because there's one Savior and only one thing that God has always wanted to say, though he spoke of it in different ways and in diverse manners in the Old Testament, but he now speaks to, it, uh, to us in Jesus. The word, I love you. The word, you're mine. The word, believe on me. And the word, rest in me. 
As the psalmist said earlier in the psalm, there's some who have confidence in, in things and princes and chariots and so on. But verse 9, it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes, the, the psalmist says. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in men. And that is what the Sabbath was about, was about, and is about. Trusting in God. Having our faith worked, as we hear the word on the Lord's day, as we come and we stop our labors, as we say, I could earn a million, maybe, if I compromised, but I want to know grace instead of what I can earn by going to God's house. You see, there's some very practical things about faith here. As we set aside our labors, as we come to this house and do what many say is a foolish thing, attend the means of grace and cease from getting ahead and cease plowing and cease pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps and so on, we rest. Israel was called to. We are called to. And that's what I want to contend right now for. There is a Christian Sabbath today. Now, hold your judgments, hold your drawing conclusions from what I just said. I haven't said how. I haven't said in what way the Sabbath is to be observed. But I have said that there is a Christian Sabbath. There is a fulfillment of the commandment and application of it today. And just as all the other commandments, we dare not just reject this rather glibly or even we say in light of a certain interpretation of Scripture, because then we have a real problem. We're denying the, the, the authenticity not only, but the application and eternal value of the commandments of God, even the fourth commandment, which is one of the moral commandments of God. Well, there are, though, many who object to the Christian Sabbath. The devil is one of them, because the devil is always trying to get us to squirm. And I'm not speaking just in the six-year-old sense, but in all of our sense that we could squirm. And I mean be restless. The wicked are like the troubled sea, Isaiah says. They're restless. They, they can't be satisfied with anything of the earth. All is vanity, the wise man says. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. All is empty. And so the wicked, they go about denying God and trying to find some substitute for the satisfaction of their souls. And they can't find any peace for their souls. And it was, as Augustine says, my soul, O Lord, finds no rest until it finds rest in thee. And that's true for us too. There's no rest. Are you restless right now? Some aspect of your life causing you to squirm and be anxious and even to despair of any help? It's because, you see, you're missing the rest in Jesus, that's amplified and, and magnified for us as we observe Sabbath even today. It's about rest in God. And, of course, the devil doesn't want that for us. The world doesn't want that for us. He says, come with us. Be wise with us and, and have the most of this world that you can and we'll satisfy you. Well, many following in the steps of the devil... Uh, proclaimed an end to the Sabbath, or they sought to end the Sabbath. They knew that in the old times, hundreds and thousands of years ago, and the churches celebrating the Sabbath and resting on the Sabbath, they knew if they could just get the people of God away from that day of rest, away from preaching, away from assembling together, they'd begin to dismantle the people of God. So Voltaire, who said, away with the infamous thing, speaking of the church, wanted nothing to do also with the church's Sabbath. And so the French Revolution, I believe it was, it issued a command. Now we're going to change the week of work. We're going to change the seven-day week to a ten-day week. It was so bad, the nation began to fall apart that they, began, they returned to the seven-day week pretty quick. God has made seven-day week one day is to be rest in him in a special, special way. Well, humanists, of course, say, okay, I'll grant you that. Who needs some rest? Even our horses need some rest. Even our workhorses need some rest. We'll rest in one day. 
Even the runners that need a rest will run six days a week, and on the seventh you can, you can rest. Well, humanists also they say we can have a family day on Sunday. We can just get together and go to the beach, get together around the tube and watch the World Cup. And that'll be our day as a family and so on. But what they're saying, though, is that the Sabbath, the Old Testament, that has nothing to do with us here. We're just spending it because we know we need some rest and some family quality time. Well, there are. I want to present to you, and I'm sure you know this, and maybe it's the case in our congregation as well, because we're young, we haven't talk so much about these things, but maybe it's the case with those who are visiting by internet or radio even today that we're confused about this. After all, isn't the Old Testament the Old Testament? Many even Christians say, and I don't doubt the sincerity of their questioning and of their pondering, and even of their Sabbath denying, because many who deny that there's a special day anymore are doing this in the name of liberty, the name of grace. They're saying, well, we're not under the law anymore. They're quoting and misquoting Paul, but we're under grace, and therefore none of the commandments apply. Certainly not the Sabbath day. Well, there's other reasons they give. What do we want to say about this? And I want to take some time, probably take a few sermons on this, but that's okay. I'm going to conclude... We're going to continue, and we're going to be happy with this wonderful, wonderful truth of the Sabbath. First of all, here's what people say. You won't find any New Testament command to observe the Sabbath day. You won't find a commandment. You'll find, they say, the other nine have no other gods, and that's either directly or by implication, they'll say. And, of course, we shouldn't commit adultery and so on. But you won't find... Now, keep the Sabbath day. And again, they say that is because we're no longer under law, but under grace. But they also point to certain texts, and I think we're mature enough to do this, to look at these texts, and they say, see these texts, and they're all in the Pauline writings, remind us that it would be wrong to keep a Sabbath day, a special day. And I'm going to look at those texts with you now. Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. In Romans chapter 14, the Apostle Paul is addressing the matter of the weak and the stronger brother in the church. Romans 14. Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. And then he goes into diet. And this seems to be a huge part of the chapter. Begins, continues, and ends with what people eat or what they don't eat on certain days. One believes, he says, he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. They're vegetarians. Vegetarianism is uh, denounced here as something of the weaker brother. If you're going to make a federal case or a biblical case that we ought not to eat meat, you're the weaker brother, according to the Apostle Paul. Let, no one, let not him who de- eats despise him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. Who are you to judge another's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he won't be, able, be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. Note this. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. So... The anti sabbatarians say one person has Sunday worship or Saturday. Another says, no, every day we worship the Lord. We don't need Sunday or Sabbath. That's the beauty of the New Testament. Okay, keep going. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. In other words, it's up to your personal preference. Then verse 6, he who observes the day, whatever that day is, observes it to the Lord. Good for him. He who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe, the, observe it. Good for her. So each can do whatever he wants. 
and uh, just don't, you know, tread on me. That's what they'd be saying. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks, and he does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. For none of, us, none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's, and so on. You can read the rest of that at your leisure. Romans 14, the first verses. Okay. Two other passages, very similar. And I want to take the time again so that we preach and teach here and then make some gospel conclusions and, and let you go. But Colossians in chapter 2, or no, let's go to Galatians chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. The Apostle Paul here, as in Romans, is being the champion of justification by faith alone. Grace saves, he says. But now he's combating with the legalists. And the Galatians are called, uh, he was writing to the Judaizers, those who would make the people Jews, Jewish Christians, so that they had to circumcise, in other words, in order to be saved. And Paul says, no, that's anathema. That's another gospel that's not a gospel. But at Galatians 4 and verse 9, he says this, but now, after you've known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? Verse 10, you observe days, Sabbath days, and months, and seasons, and years. I am afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. Okay, there is a reference to certain days that people were observing and keeping, along with seasons and years that people were keeping. And Paul says, that's terrible. You're liberated by the gospel. Why are you going back to what he says is Judaism? Why are you going back to weak and beggarly elements whereby God taught an Old Testament people which was childish under the tutor tutelage of the law and the Old Covenant? Why are you doing that? And so the anti sabbatarians say, why are you doing that? You who are preaching a commandment that's no longer applicable. That's what they'll say to us, even as we speak today. But then one more, Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Colossians 2, 16 and 17. <clears throat> Paul here is speaking of a terribly alarming occurrence among the Colossians. And that's this. There were disturbers of the peace. There were teachers who were teaching people to follow their own um, pedagogy, their own instruction, and leaving off holding in esteem Christ himself. They were not holding the head by their doctrines. They were not giving him the preeminence. Instead, they were giving their own doctrines and commandments of men the most important thing, and obedience to them they saw as the most important thing so that they would get a following and not Jesus. In that uh, context... He speaks thus in Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, plural, which are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels and tooting on these things which he's not seen vainly puffed up uh, by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head, to Jesus. All right. You see how important it is that we be clear on this. Three passages I brought forth that the anti sabbatarians that is, the ones who say there's no such thing now as Sunday observance and being holy on this day in a special way, they seem to have a case. The texts there speak of things that people were doing, including observing Sabbaths and festivals and new moons and dietary restrictions and so on, which would seem to go against the New Testament and the gospel of our liberation. And so they say, you who preach the fourth commandment and that it applies in a rigid or holy way to today are being a legalist. You congregation that would dare to follow the instruction of a pastor or of a whole denomination or a whole Presbyterian and Reformed tradition that has always upheld the Lord's Day as sacred and the fulfillment of the New Testament Sabbath, you've got it wrong. In fact, you're leading the people back to the weak and beggarly elements of the Old Testament. This is bondage, not liberation. This is exactly contrary 
to the gospel. Now, I lay it out because I want us to be honest and open and fair to our brothers even who disagree with us on these things and not just about certain practices that we might do on Sunday, going to church and so on, but about the principle of Sabbath. And I beg that anyone hearing now who needs to be persuaded of what I believe is the biblical position would give me a fair hearing and also those who are even adamantly opposed to what I'm about to say. Give a fair hearing, let God speak. First of all, I want to say this. The New Testament confirms the Sabbath of the Old Testament as being for us today. Confirms it in a New Testament way as fulfilled in Jesus, to be sure, but confirms it and calls us to observe it as well. Here's why. And here's why there's no specific command for us to observe the Sabbath day as there is in the Old Testament, Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5. Here's why. The Sabbath is a creation ordinance. Just as marriage instituted in Genesis, in the creation of man and then in woman, and they were married, so, and, and as that applies to today, so the rest of God set forth as a pattern for our week of, of, of labor and of rest is a creation ordinance. Just as the marriage that was instituted and to which Jesus refers in the Gospels is for today, so is the Sabbath, and so, mind you, is every other of the Ten Commandments. This is something to be meditated upon. You know, the Ten Commandments that were given to Israel in stone were already written down before that. Where, you say? Where, Reverend Dick? In the heart. Human beings were created with a conscience, and in the conscience of man, God created man and women, rational and moral, with a sense of obligation and a direction as to how they are to obey God. And though we don't understand just how God revealed these things to human beings and how God revealed also the fourth commandment, nevertheless, we know this. Why? Because in the law of God, which the Bible itself celebrates as the way of life, and the keeping of which is great reward, there is this revelation of God. You see, God made the creation to be a testimony of his glory. And when he made men and women with a conscience, he made men and women to know something of the eternal power and Godhead of God and the judgeship of God and the obligation to which they find themselves simply by being creation of God. So, would we not say that God made Adam to love God with all his heart, mind, strength, and soul? Of course he did, even though it's not said. There's no one specific commandment in paradise that says this. It doesn't need to be said. Even though certainly Adam was called to worship God and not other gods, nevertheless, it's not written, but it was in his heart. And so we could go with all of the other commandments. And again, not saying that all of them were similarly revealed and as clearly revealed to Israel as in paradise. Nevertheless, they were there. The sum and substance of Sabbath was there. Take time to be holy, God was saying. And here's the day that I've given. And the very first day, I want to point out to you, of Adam's life, the very first full day, was a Sabbath. God was resting then. And Adam, newly created, stepped into that dawn of the new day, resting with God. And I believe that all of human beings have been called to that rest, however light, much light they have or not, since the creation. Jesus himself in the New Testament, when he was expounding the commandments in Matthew 5, 6 and 7, that's the Sermon on the Mount expounding the commandment, don't commit adultery, don't murder, and so on. He said this, I came not to abolish but to fulfill. And the question is, how did he come to fulfill the commandments of God? 
And I believe he came to fulfill them exactly in not abolishing them, but filling them up with meaning. So whenever we think of Sabbath and how to observe it, we have to say this, Jesus didn't abolish it. And that's why he would say to those in the Sabbath controversies, of which there were many, that the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. He's Lord. Is he in heaven? Is Jesus Lord? He's Lord of the Sabbath. And it's not right to say, well, he is. And we observe Sabbath every day. And therefore, we don't need one day. That's not correct to say that. Here's why. God said in the fourth commandment, there's a day you should set aside from all your labor, and the implication is rest in me. And it's silly. I will even say that respectfully to those who may disagree, to say that a day isn't important. The fourth commandment says it is. The fourth commandment doesn't say just be holy. Be holy all your days. It says be holy on this day. Why? You need it. When Jesus fulfills it, he doesn't abolish the day. He fills the day up with meaning as well as the rest up with meaning. As we'll see presently, it's all seen on his resurrection day, which the church saw as the day now that's been transformed from Old Testament Sabbath and to New Testament Lord's Day. Well, much more that's going to be said about this. I trust that this instruction was the gospel to you because this is what I want to leave you with. In the Old Testament, way back then, dearly beloved, they were rejoicing in the day to come, Jesus' resurrection. And they said of that day, oh, I've got to read it for you. They said of that day, and that thing that happened when the stone that was rejected by the builders had become the chief cornerstone, they said, well, this is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. And then they said, this is the day, surely this is the day the Lord has made. We're going to rejoice and be glad in it. And that I submit to you, God would say to us today, is what Sabbath keeping is all, in, all about. It's about rejoicing in Jesus on a certain day, and then every day, but on a certain day, that wonderful day the Lord has given, called the Lord's Day, in which the early church was worshiping from day one, and now which the church of Jesus Christ receives as a blessing, the day the Lord has made. People of God, whatever you do every day, whatever you do on the Sabbath day, be rejoicing and take your gladness and your comfort in the day of the resurrection of Jesus. Rejoice in him. No forgiveness in him. Labor to enter that rest. Come away from the distractions. Leave them all behind. Turn the radios off. Get ready Saturday night. Work all your work week in the light of that heaven that's to come on the Lord's day in anticipation of what it stands for, the eternal rest. But now, there's a day given. And the God of the old covenant, you see, he doesn't want us in the new covenant to come short of blessing. He gives us the day now. But it's the day in which the light has dawned the light of the coming Savior who's coming again. Rest in him, dear ones. And all you who are restless, come to the rest giver on the Lord's day in the Lord's house and then every day by faith and he will give you rest. Sabbath day's rest. Praise the Lord. Amen. We pray, Lord, that you would bless as we begin to contemplate our rest in you and you would bless us and you would make your face to shine upon us and give us lord not to err give us lord to be bold because you are the one who has revealed yourself as the god of eternity and the god of our time every day Bless us on the Lord's day in your house as we hear of Jesus Christ crucified for our sins and delivered for our justification, risen to your right hand. Bless us, Lord, that all this day and, 
as we return to your house at night, we may assemble together and find our peace and our all together in you. Hear us, we pray, and pardon our many sins of speaking and of hearing. And give us, Lord, to know your truth that sets us free. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Number 234, the rest of versification of Psalm 118, 234, 5, 7, and 8. Receive God's blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you now and forevermore. Amen.